This broadcast is produced in partnership with the Multi-Jurisdictional Counter-Drug Task Force Training Program, the Florida National Guard, and St. Petersburg College. Hello, I'm Stan Rhodes, and welcome to the broadcast. Today, we're going to discuss what's been called an underreported crime with way too many victims. As a matter of fact, more than once a minute, 78 times an hour, or more than 1,800 times a day, someone in the United States is a victim of sexual assault, and drugs are often part of the crime. Today, we have gathered a panel of experts to talk about this topic and the title of our broadcast, Without Consent, drugs, and sexual assault. Let me introduce my guests. Trinka Parada retired from the Los Angeles Police Department after 25 years of service. She is an expert about drug-facilitated sexual assault and the drugs often used to commit it. Detective Bonnie Weiss is with the Toledo Police Department. She began to learn a lot about drug-facilitated sexual assault after several incidents happened in her city, and she's here to share her knowledge. Stephen O'Keefe is a retired prosecutor in Pinellas County, Florida. He was with the prosecutor's office for 19 years and was also a special agent with the FBI for 20 years. Well, welcome, everyone. Glad to have you on the broadcast. As I said, the title of our broadcast is Without Consent. We're talking about drugs and sexual assault. We could work backwards with this and say we're talking about assault, sexual assault, drugs and sexual assault, and without consent. Let's open this up, and I'm going to start with you, Trinka. Let's talk about drug-facilitated sexual assault. Explain that to me. Well, just the fact that alcohol is present doesn't make it a drug-facilitated sexual assault. Alcohol is kind of a background drug. But anytime you have incapacitation because of too much alcohol or drugs, and there's at least 40 drugs that have been identified, where it renders the person incapable of giving or withholding consent, that does not mean they'll be unconscious. They may be unconscious all or part of the time, but their behavior, their conduct, and their mental status makes them in, unable to give or withhold consent. Mm -hmm. Stephen, what are we talking about, consent? The person willingly, knowingly, unknowingly has no idea what's going on? What do we mean? Consent is one of the biggest problems that the investigator faces. The investigator has to put together the facts of the case to give those to the district attorney or the prosecutor the investigator has to determine whether there in fact has been a crime, mm -hmm. not just whether people have consented or not consented to do something. The thing they, to which they have to consent in this case is a sexual act. And that's where we come into the territory of sexual assault or in many states what they call sexual battery, the actual touching. Is it always that black and white? where you can determine whether there has been consent or non-consent? It's never black and white. That's the problem, and that's why there are so many unhappy people on all sides of this issue. Bonnie, I'll bring you into this. Has this particular assault, we're talking about sexual assault or drug rape, is it often reported, and I can ask you as well, Stephen, but does it get reported? Do people bring this up? I believe it's very underreported. The victim may not realize what happened to them. They're very embarrassed about reporting it because they don't know what happened to them. And oftentimes we don't have a witness to come forward other than the victim. So it's very difficult for, to put a case together without a lot of evidence. And if someone does not come forth and they don't report it, what kind of problems come about from that? As, a, as the victim, um, well, she will suffer many problems psychologically, maybe emotionally, um, because she doesn't know what happened to her. She probably lost at least four hours of her life and does not know what happened to Still her. Still being blanked out. Yes. Mm -hmm. On top of that, if it goes unreported, that means the predator will strike again. That's These are all serial rapists, always. Um, and the more often they get away with it, then the more aggressive they'll get with, with doing it. Are, are we talking just about women? 
or uh, Absolutely men as well? Absolutely not. No, no, this happens to men too. Uh, Lexington, Kentucky had a series of them where men were found semi-conscious out in the alley by the trash can. Gay or straight doesn't really matter either. Mm -hmm. And pants down around their ankles and no idea how they got there. When we talk and think about a victim, is there a, a typical victim that fits a scenario in this? No. And it can happen to anybody, any age, any economic background. We have rape victims, drug rape victims from you know, nine, ten years old to 77. You know, it just, it can happen to anybody. It can happen in fancy restaurants. It can happen at fraternity parties. I mean, it just is across the board and it's not being reported. Is there a typical offender in this, Stephen? This is a big problem in that there are many more instances of improper or criminal conduct than will ever go reported. Back in in 1999, they did a study that was financed by the Center for Disease Control and the National Institute of Justice. They found out during that study that there were 300,000 or so women who were subjected to some kind of sexual crime reported. And there were 100,000 men, so that's three to one. Mm -hmm. And yet, in 2007, the FBI crime reports show some 90,000 or so reports, police reports, of sexual attacks, but only 23,000 arrests. And of mm. those 23,000 arrests, you start to get into the area of how many of those were proper reports, how many were unfounded, and in the alternative, how many were proved to be false reports. So now you're getting into all kinds of problems about do statistics really mean anything? Or do you actually have real victims who never report what happened to them? So this and is a, a lot of people, I don't mind I'm interrupting no, you on ahead. that, a lot of people who are merely complainants, who don't know what happened to them, but think something happened to them, or they would like it to be a certain way. And we want to be sure as prosecutors, that we find the complainants who are actually victims and we try to help the police get it right so that if the prosecutor files a charge, we then can present the facts to the jury. The members mm -hmm. of the community are going to make a decision. So you know the prosecutor cannot please everybody anytime. Right, right. So we're talking about uh, the investigation has to be thorough. But how many kinds of drugs are we talking about here? You had mentioned that there are over 40? There's more than 40 drugs. You know, you'll hear them talk about the date rape drugs, which I hate that term because it has nothing to do with the date most of the time. But <clears> you'll hear them talk about just two or three drugs. But any drug that's a central nervous system depressant, uh, any drug that is going to um, put you to sleep or uh, intoxicated. But also we consider all hallucinogens and ecstasy to be rape drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't render you unconscious, but they render you unable to give or withhold consent. Now, I noticed on this list that we were just looking at that alcohol was number one. Was that al alphabetical or is that because it is number one? Alcohol is still number one because the simplest drug rape is that I'm at a party and you're mixing the drinks and I think mm -hmm. I had three rum and cokes, but you double shotted my drinks. And so I drank at a level that I thought was safe mm -hmm. for three drinks, but mm -hmm. really I, I was consuming twice that much. So that's the simplest form of a drug rape. You know, I would just want to say something about the uh, underreporting. Um, to give you an idea, I was in and out of hospitals when I got bitten by a spider, and in doing so, I was talking to, these are nurses, nursing students, and doctors, not even average people. These are people involved in the medical field, and because they would ask questions about what I was doing, during that time, 15 or 16 people discussed things that happened to them or a friend, everything from simply suddenly getting bizarrely drunk at a party and friends taking them home, to completed rapes. Not one of them had been reported, and that's just a tiny little sampling. Sixteen people that had had bizarre incidents that unquestionably, you know, fit the pattern of drug, drugging, and yet not one had been reported to the police. That's frightening. So what, what are the numbers here? We're talking about, Stephen had given out some numbers in terms of people who had reported. How many of these go unreported? I think it's way beyond anything we can imagine because, um, especially if you don't get raped, your friends go, gosh, you're acting weird, and they take you home. 
um, what are you going to do, call the police and say, gee, I think somebody drugged me? They're going to say, so what? No harm, no foul. You know, they're not going to do anything. People end up in the hospital overdose on, on mm -hmm. obviously somebody had given them something, and it ends up not being handled because they weren't raped, they weren't robbed, it was, you know, interrupted, right. and it goes nowhere, mm -hmm. and yet that was a drugging with the intention of probably committing sexual assault or robbery. Bonnie, is it hard to qualify a, a person, a, a victim who has been assaulted? Is it hard to qualify that they've had a sexual assault with Ab drugs? Absolutely, and part of the problem is the first line officer. If the uniform officer doesn't recognize, um, for instance, a female that may have been drugged a as a drugging, um, by the time I get the report, hopefully the next day, maybe three days later, she pretty much, it's all cleared her system, and she can only tell me about what happened to her. So it's too late at that point. Yes, and if, and if someone didn't help her get to a hospital, if someone didn't recognize that there was some, she was impaired, it's too late. My evidence has evaporated, it's gone, and it's mm. a very difficult case for me. So we know there are over 40 drugs that can be used. Alcohol is number one. What are some of the symptoms that a person is impaired? Well, you know, any sign of intoxication, sleepiness, loss of consciousness, um, suddenly sick and vomiting or very drunk and acting very disinhibited, and yet they've only consumed one or two alcoholic beverages or maybe none. Um, you know, this, this sudden change, you know, with some of these drugs, you're going to get a very abrupt change in behavior. So you serve me my second drink, and five minutes later I face plant into the table. That's obviously, you know, a sign of something terribly, terribly abnormal for mm -hmm. just drinking. Um, one of the problems is that the effects in the, in the long run may appear similar to a lot of alcohol, but when you know the person didn't consume a lot of alcohol, um, you know, it, that's the key. You would have to consume a lot of alcohol to equal these effects, and there's going to be a time change, and you're going to remember a certain amount up to this point. With drugging, there may be an abrupt loss of consciousness or an abrupt loss of memory. And it just erases the memory? It, it may stops. erase it completely, 100%, on the, just boom, from A to Z, there's nothing. They may have bits and pieces, little, I call them cameo appearances, uh, where of they may remember just little little snippets mm -hmm. of something happening. They may remember being dragged down the stairway. They may remember, uh, you know, the victim or the suspect on top of them. They may, may remember little tiny pieces, not necessarily even in chronological order. Um, one of the things we see, light seems to get through, so they may say, I couldn't open my eyes, I felt there was a bright light. It so might it's be. not a total unconsciousness. No, and they may actually, you know, the problem is your victim doesn't know whether she passed out or blacked out. So when a victim says, I passed out, and the cops go and talk to witnesses there, and they say, passed out, are you kidding? That broad was up on top of the bar ripping her clothes off. And what, the first thought is, see, she's lying. No, she's not lying. She was unconscious. Mm. Part of her brain was unconscious. She doesn't recall that behavior. You can't prove amnesia, so it's really tough. Yeah. Um, but she may be actually, depending on the drug, she may be very sexual. GHB is a sexual stimulant. Uh, she may be dirty dancing with her friends, and they're like, what are you doing? Uh, she may be ripping her clothes off, acting sure. a fool. She may be acting totally bizarre, and yet, as far as she knows, she was unconscious because she doesn't remember any of that. Can I add something for you, though? Yes, go ahead. Just for the benefit of those who are investigating this kind of a, an offense or somebody who might be thinking about whether they should make a report. Uh, she mentioned that there are instances in which friends take a person uh, who appears to be incapacitated to mm -hmm. some degree uh, to keep them safe because they believe that person might have been given some kind of drug. Not now, taken to a hospital, no, but just maybe to a home away. or something. Okay. And we don't want people to think they shouldn't report that. As a prosecutor, as former investigator and law enforcement officer, I can tell you that we don't, for want of a better term, poo-poo what you have to say mm -hmm. just because you might have been drunk or because, gee, that happened a while ago, uh, to say that we believe someone was victimized by ropinol or GHB or any of the, the drugs that are used and that we're just going to let it go because you weren't sexually battered is misleading. Right? It might happen that somebody makes a bad decision as a police officer taking complaints. But there's a federal statute under Title 18 that says that the providing of such a drug is a federal offense. 
Why should we forget that? Why should anybody ignore a complaint filer just because we think they might not have it right or, well, nothing really serious happened to you? That's not the point. So the all point details is, are can important. we prove it yeah. well, if you have evidence that somebody received something? Mm-hmm. If you follow through and find a witness who said, I saw so-and-so put something in Harry's drink over there, and after that, within five minutes, he started to act like an idiot. Now we're talking. If it isn't too long in the past, someone can make a quick investigation, try to find some evidence, try to find a witness. Well, it's not that we want people to say, don't report this if you don't feel that you were sexually battered. Is that, is there evidence? If there's evidence, then let's go forward. Well, but the point is that this is being ignored. These cases are Mm -hmm. being dismissed. They're being dismissed by the first police officers who respond. They're being dismissed by the hospitals. That's exactly why we're doing this. It is being kissed off. We're going to take a short break, and we'll continue our discussion about drug-facilitated sexual assault cases. There's never been anybody lower than me. I used to shoot meth with my daughter. My worst day not using meth is better than my best day whenever I was using meth. I'm still baffled by the speed of how I lost everything so quickly. Someone has to want to stop. It's not an easy road. It's not an easy road to stop. That's what did it. My mom finally said that we can't watch you do this to yourself anymore. You can recover from methamphetamine abuse. I'm proof of it. One in five kids will sniff household products to get high. Inhalant abuse can kill them, even the first time. Talk to your kids today about the dangers of inhalant abuse. Yep. They don't trade baseball cards anymore. To learn more, visit drugfree.org. Just by keeping tabs after school, they'll be less likely to use drugs and alcohol. For support, visit theantidrug.com. Freeze one. There were stacks of heads chiseling in the easy. There were stacks of heads chiseling in the easy. Freeze two. Homie was flossing his grip of cheddar. Homie was flossing his grip of cheddar. His whip is a janky hoopty. His whip is a janky hoopty. Janky hoopty. His whip is a janky hoopty. You may not understand your kids, but your kids understand you. Talk to them about drugs. Need help? Get help. Visit our website at drugfree.org. Welcome back to our broadcast, Without Consent, Drugs and Sexual Assault. Law enforcement officers and first responders hear all kinds of stories from assault victims. Some would seem almost impossible. That's especially true in drug-facilitated sexual assault cases when the drugs cause things like blackouts and hallucinations. And Trink, I want to go back to something you said at the beginning of the broadcast. You said you don't like the term date rape. It's not. They'll refer to date rape drug, and I don't like that term because there are acquaintance rapes or date rapes. Mm -hmm. There's stranger rapes, but drugs neither know nor care whether you're on a date. And people who use drugs, it, it, it may be the guy across the bar that sneaks over when you go to the bathroom and slips some in your drink, that's not a date. date. Uh, So the correct term would be rape drug or predatory drug, because they're also the same drugs are also used to facilitate robbery. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just hate the term date rape drug because it absolutely is a misnomer. Gotcha. She's right on the money. Very good. Bonnie, how do you know when someone is telling you the truth or isn't? Do you assume that they're not 
or do you take the position, well, maybe they are? I like to assume that they are telling me the truth. It's Have you always taken that standpoint? I try to. Sometimes mm -hmm. a personal bias may get in the way. As I mentioned before, I get a report already written by an officer mm -hmm. where they have made, taken a personal bias in it. So I read that report first before I talk to my victim. And unfortunately, sometimes that gets in the way. But I, I really do try to assume that she's telling me the truth until I can prove otherwise. And sometimes I can't. So I assume that she's telling me the truth. And how, how has that worked for you? Do, you? do you find that most of the victims have been telling you the truth? In the drug cases, mm -hmm. um, as much as they can remember. As much but, as they can remember. Yes. A lot yeah. of times we rely on a witness, and there aren't witnesses. Uh, help me understand the behaviors of someone who is drugged. Uh, what are the, the possible symptoms that you might be seeing? Well, it depends on the drug. There's a lot of variety, but the most important thing is a sudden change in mental status. Um, the person who's suddenly very drunk suddenly goes from uh, very active to inactive or from uh, very calm and quiet to very agitated or very sleepy. It can, there's a huge array of differences. So the suddenness of it, the suddenness of the onset, uh, with the drug GHB, for example, you may have two people drugged at the same time. One becomes violently ill and the other becomes wildly, crazily drunk and, and very sexual um, acting. So not um, everyone responds to the different drugs. No, you have way. very different effects. Um, but the biggest thing is the suddenness of the change. Uh, the dramatic level of change, and, and you know, it's not that gradual build up from drinking and one more drink, one more drink. Um, it can be sick, drunk, uh, with, hallucin with the hallucinogens like ecstasy. Your 13 year old on ecstasy can't tell the difference between a back rub and sex. But she's not sleepy or unconscious. She's going to be very hyper, very active, and very touchy feely. Every touch feels good. People who are hallucinating, if mm -hmm. someone gives them LSD, um, that's not going to put them to sleep, but they're going to be seeing things that aren't there. They're going to be trying to jump off the table and, because they think they can fly, you know, crazy things like that. So you get a huge array of, of behaviors. The most dramatic single thing is suddenness of onset of the change. Are we talking about a drug that has to be ingested where it's got to be eaten or... or the vast majority involve uh, consuming the drink orally. Consuming the drink. Uh, a, a drink okay. or food. You know, we've had ecstasy ground up and put in the salsa that incapacitated some girls. But we've also had a couple of really strange cases where they did not eat or drink anything, and we think that that, they, but they were in uh, massage parlors or a tanning salon where something was rubbed on them. And we think that involved possibly DMSO, which is a penetrating solvent, and maybe something like scopolamine, which is also transdermal and would go in faster with DMSO. Um, those were some really rare cases that we didn't hear about soon enough to do a lot with, but it's also possible. Most of the time you're talking eating or drinking Ingesting something. Ingesting of some sort. Right. Bonnie, I understand that you became involved in all of this because of a, a victim that you had been working with. You didn't believe them in the first place, but they actually were telling you the truth? Yes, she was. Tell us about Again, it. Um, the first line officers, there were, it was a two-person crew, um, they actually were called to a residential neighborhood as a woman was going from door to door asking for help. And in, in, I live in Toledo, Ohio. It was snowing. They were able to, no one would allow her assist in their home. A lady said, I'll call the police, stay on my porch. Well, she couldn't, wouldn't stay on the porch, so the police were able to talk to that woman and follow her footprints, and they located her in a school parking lot. And... Um, she acted very out of character, and again, the police officers told me that they felt she was a drunk or high young lady mm -hmm. that got herself in a situation with a male that she couldn't handle, and they did not initially believe her story. Mm. Um, her report landed on my desk a few days later, and honestly, I thought the same thing. I read the way they wrote it right. and said, oh, she got herself into some trouble. So, and you saw the video that they saw? Not initially. Not initially? I did, I did okay. not see that no. for quite a while. It wasn't until I talked with her on the telephone at length that she convinced me that that wasn't her personality, that in fact she was an upstanding person in our community, and she felt that she got drugged. But we actually do have a copy of that video. It was a videotape recorded by a police dashboard camera. As officers talked with this woman, and her actions and words showed signs of possible drugging. And we're going to take a look and listen to some of what she said and did. It was never confirmed, but I said, okay, this is too 
totally weird. But you know what? Hey, I get to go home to be with my babies. That's what I said to him. I go, let me go home to be with my babies. Because that's what matters in life is my babies. But you know what? I, no one ever came out of that room. Uh, and uh, where, where were you guys sitting at? In the front room or in the living room? No, I was living room or something. Oh, it was the living room. Okay. You, you were sitting on the couch, I, both of you? It wasn't even sitting. It was more like, um, hey, guess what this is like. What? Like the next step. And it wasn't even like expecting it. It was like this is it. They told me, Brian, I just did not know what was <laughs> happening to me. <laughs> and you know what's so f***ed up? Is I'm smarter than this. I'm smarter than this. I just... Then, then what? Smarter than what? Smarter than this bull I have a family. I have yes, a... Do you recognize any house here? You want me to tell you to where it was? You know? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you where it is. <laughs> you tell my husband I'm okay, and I'll tell you where it is. Okay, let me get my partner here. Don't! You tell my husband I'm okay! Your husband knows you're okay. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. Don't tell him I'm okay. 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 Okay. And you're going to show us where he, yes. where he told you? Yes, I'll tell you where okay. it's at. Okay, all right. I'll tell you where it's at. And I'll get out and lock it. And you follow me, okay? Well, we're not you get out and follow me. I'll tell you where it's at. Kim, do you remember if you came through here, this parking lot right here? I don't know. Okay. I, no, I didn't go I through. I followed your tracks all the way up to that corner there, and then I Whoa. kind of lost him. But <laughs> I found some tracks coming here, okay? We're going to take you home now, okay? Guys, yeah, I can tell you crazy. me. I I know. You did good. You did good. Okay? <laughs> Fell down a couple times. Yes, I did. Fell down a couple times. I, I would think I'd hang out with my girlfriend and I'd be fine when I'm not. F***ing ring me. <laughs> How did you guys catch me? How did you guys see me on the street? I don't understand. The lady at that house that you knocked on the door. I'm a lawyer. I should be. Oh. We're talking about this sh oh. <laughs> I just get it. You know what? What personal injury attorney? No. I do uh, personal injury and in, uh, family law. And uh, I do... Uh, Anything about the car? Um, was it a four-door? No, it was a two-door. And it was probably like a Chevy Gibbler. I didn't want to be with him. How long have you been married? I, um, I don't know. Oh, five? No, wait a minute. Wait, what's this year? Oh, five? Yeah. Remember, five years. You've been married for five years? Yeah. So, I mean, we've been happily married. So, I mean, this whole thing is no thing. It's pregnant for me. Do you live in Ottawa Hills there? No, I don't live in Ottawa Hills. What's it close to? Is it close to the hospital? Uh, no, it's, yeah, well, this guy is going to rape me! <laughs> you know what? I got out because him <laughs> guy is going to walk away. Did you guys maybe exchange phone numbers? No. Nothing? No. The whole time I get, oh, Shelly. The whole time I get, okay, he's going to take me home. Hey, Hello. You know, and even if you thought did that you I wanted maybe something, where you he had work? my voice. Did you know. he maybe mention where you work? No. What no. did you guys talk about? Uh, you know what? I'll tell you what. A lot of it was all about shit. How am I, how am I gonna get away from this man? Is there anything? There was a girl. There was a girl that walked away when we walked in. That we, when we walked in, she she didn't, she didn't say a word. No, she walked away. Did that guy say anything to her? I don't know, but she <laughs> walked away. How long do you think you were at the house? 30 minutes. 30 minutes? 30 minutes. 
What kind of coat were you wearing in this movie? Coat? I don't know. I had on like, uh, um, I had on a, um, it's no longer there. Before you left, did you tell your girlfriend that what you're doing? No, I just thought, yeah, you know, hey, I'm going home. I'll see you later. What up, miss? We're almost there. Yes. All right, I'm gonna pull around this time. Totally try to great. Yes, I am. And they're they're pulling around, and they're gonna pull into the driveway. And I want you to come and get me. I don't want to walk outside. Yes, you were there. Is this it right here? Pull up! Pull up! Pull up! Okay, goodbye. <laughs> How did you get me? How did you get me? Was I walking down the street? No, you weren't. Wow, very compelling. Bonnie, this, uh, this kind of was a watershed moment for you. It certainly was. It gives me goosebumps to hear it today. To see it again. It does. And, and it's what changed you from thinking that someone might be telling lies to telling the truth. Absolutely. What, what was it that, that really did that for you? In my discussions with her, and then I took some extensive training, and actually that's how I met Trinka, and I took it upon myself to learn more about drug-facilitated mm -hmm. assaults, mm -hmm. and then attempted to get some education to the rest of the guys in our department. Wow. Stephen, what are your thoughts about this, seeing this? About the tape? Yes. Well, if I were presented with the tape immediately by an investigating officer who would have asked me for an opinion, I would have said, that, number one, this is a person making a complaint of being raped. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you did something to look for evidence of rape. Number two, this person is telling you that she ingested something somehow, and what did you do to find out whether that happened? And I would ask the officer to be sure to look at the case impartially and to look for evidence so that at a later time, no one could challenge that officer right. for having a predisposition right. either for or against somebody, because that would uh, cause their credibility to be brought in question. So that's a terrible, terrible videotape, and I'm sure that poor person will never recover from that. There's Probably no way not. that that person would recover from it. But what can be done, right. that would be something in the hands of the investigator. So, Trinka, what should a first responder do? Well, sadly, with that tape, she was clearly under the influence. And she actually provided them a great deal of information more than she remembers telling them. She doesn't remember most of that conversation. But, but do you um, think she threw, her, threw them off through that conversation? Because some of the time she seemed almost coherent that she could talk and then... Well, that's the problem. Your victim is not really there mm -hmm. they're gonna they oh. may actually respond uh, and give you a, a, a lot of information may appear to be responding um, but they may be um, hallucinating even they may not even be talking normally sometimes officers come upon people who are mm -hmm. virtually hallucinating talking to people who aren't there the most but, important but thing what kind is, of information did she give to those officers she provided information to them that she didn't want to be with them that she said no that she um, um, they kept trying to put it into, oh, did you exchange phone numbers with them? Right. You know, they were trying very hard to put that into a social context. She is clearly under the influence. She is clearly incapacitated. She is not in a, in a condition to give or withhold consent. And, and she had a visible head injury, as I understand. She should have been taken to a hospital for evaluation. Boom. First thing. You know, what I try to get across to first responders is you've got to kind of run with it. Take it at face value. Um, you know, don't disbelieve people. I'm not saying it's set in cement that everything people say is true, but take it and run with it. When you've got a visible head injury, altered mental status, and an allegation of rape mm -hmm. and or, you know, basically kidnapping, she was in the right. car with him, didn't want to be in with the house right. she didn't want to be with, um, you don't take them home and drop them off. You and that's what the these officers were doing. Yes, We're going to take her did. home instead of going to have, what, tests well, yeah. uh, to the hospital, to a doctor? Absolutely. She should have been taken to a hospital because she was, and, and sadly, she would have tested positive that night. She was under the influence at that moment, clearly. And what kind of tests are we talking about, though? 
well, drug tests, the problem is most hospitals can't test for GHB, but at least they can eliminate. The most important thing is a blood alcohol level. Okay. We know what she drank, so we blood, know she blood, what have. else beyond the blood? Well, you want the blood alcohol level, or you want urine. Urine is the key, but you want to know their alcohol level, because if they have a, a blood alcohol level of O2 in that condition, you're looking for drugs. Hospitals, though, cannot do the complete testing. They may do a drug screen. They may say, oh, look, we found benzos. That may indicate that... Um, Ativan or Rohypnol or Valium or something like that was used, even if the hospital finds a negative, um, you, then you have to look beyond that. If you think you've got drugs, you have to go beyond the hospital. Hospitals do screening tests. They're not going to find GHB. Most of them can't test for GHB. Um, so it's not an in-depth test? They don't do an in-depth. It's screening, and it's just for certain So if you get a negative categories. result... You, you may still not need go to further? keep going. You, and that's the problem is all, too often we stop. Well, the hospital tested for drugs and didn't find anything, but they're doing only a screening and only for a couple of drugs. This is one of the problems we have with educating officers. I mean, when I first came on the job, I thought when I turned in a urine sample for, for rape or DUI, I thought they tested for everything. I thought it was a CSI world 30 years ago, <laughs> you know, because they didn't tell you that, well, oh, it, we only test for a couple right. of drugs. But so. are the results available that fast, as we see on CSI? Mm -hmm. No, it is not a CSI world, but the hospital will do a screening test and they will know right away some basic stuff. But again, if you think you have a person under the influence, whether it's DUI or rape or whatever, and you really feel that, you don't stop with a hospital test. You get a urine sample, you want urine, not blood, um, and you want to take it to the crime lab and have a complete test done. Now, is the urine not the blood, or do both show the presence, if it is there, of GHB? If they're under the influence of the drug at the time, and specifically with GHB, just because it's the hardest drug, if the person is under the influence, as she was at that moment, mm -hmm. and it happens to be GHB, you will get a positive in blood. But it's only in blood four hours and urine 12. By the time you get her to the hospital, for example, say she's now talking rationally and calmed down, mm -hmm. it's too late for blood. You have to do urine. So you just mentioned two time, you mentioned four hours and 12 hours. Right. And you mentioned 12 hours, it's still in there under 12, it would still be present in the urine? If it was GHB, it would still be present in urine. If it was other drugs, it would be there actually longer. GHB is one of the fastest ones to leave the system. Does it manifest anywhere else within the body? I mean, in skin or anything else? Well, what we hope someday will be the future will be hair testing. There are no companies in the United States that do proper hair testing for GHB. You know, because with meth, if I test a strand of hair and it's positive for meth, bingo, you, you did meth. Mm -hmm. With GHB, there's naturally occurring levels. And so if you just test a strand of hair, it'll be you positive. Uh, yeah. What they do in France, and they can't believe we don't do this here, they do it by segmentation and special instrumentation. And they do segments. And so say just picking numbers at random, your normal was four, you know, four or five. So four or five, four or five, four or five, four or five. And bingo, um, out here there's a 90. Well, that number of days ago, you ingested or Somewhere exposed to GHB. Right, right. Um, it's very expensive and time-consuming, so the American testing companies aren't doing it yet, but we hope that's the future because you wait 30 days to take the hair sample. Bonnie, working with this particular lady, and she was obviously, uh, well, she was a victim of sexual assault. You didn't think that in the beginning. How did you come to that conclusion? By her testimony, by, by, her her testi in, by her interview, I should say. It never went to court. Was um, there blood testing or urine testing or anything? No, I mean, it was way too late. It was way too late. By the time um, she did go to a doctor, but it was Monday by the time she went. So they found no evidence. So what he had, her, her statement is all we had. And the statement of everybody that she was at the bar with that night that said she didn't drink that much. Something happened to her. Unfortunately, um, her... Her friends went as a group. Um, they noticed her behavior changed. She had to use the restroom. No one went to the restroom with her. They assumed she was going to be safe to walk from her bar stool to the restroom. And somewhere in between there, the suspect intercepted her and walked out the front door with her. And she willingly went with him. And, and so the friends did not notice that somewhere along the line her drink had been tainted with something. No. Is that what happened? That's what happened, exactly what happened. It was a cosmopolitan, which is a fruity drink, and that's often the ones that they will taint. She realized that it didn't taste right. She took a sip of it and tried to give it away, but no one wanted it. All she took was one, maybe two sips. She remembers one, but that maybe potent? two. Yes. Yeah, GHB may float on top. In that case, it was probably so butane dial, which floats on top yeah. uh, if it's not mixed. He probably didn't have a chance to stir it. It was just dropped in there. You know, it's so easy to dose somebody's drink. 
And, you know, that's the sad thing is that she recognized, she sipped and said, oh, this doesn't taste right. And they're like, oh, you know, no one else wanted to taste it. And they ended up, oh, just get rid of it and we'll buy you a beer. Right. I, she didn't even make mm -hmm. it through half of the beer. Mm -hmm. And dramatic personality changes, very sexually oriented, right. very strange behavior. And so really her blood alcohol level would have been bizarrely low. And so, should have triggered testing. So let's come back. You, you, in, in the interview process, the girlfriends didn't uh, see anything, didn't, didn't realize that she had been intercepted, that she was escorted out of the building, wherever it was. This Absolutely took place. not. It was a Saturday night, a, a very, very busy bar, and they, they didn't miss her for quite some time. As a matter of fact, I believe it was about closing time by the time they realized she wasn't there. They hunted the bar for her, called her husband to see if she had found another mm -hmm. ride home. And um, that's when the hunt began for her, but she was already in his car. Oh my. So, so, so how do you establish a timeline here of what took place? Well, that's real, very, very important. And again, it goes back to what Steve was saying. And in a wonderful world, I would have been there at the bar that night to collect evidence, to collect that drink if it hadn't been tossed. Or the first responders would have. Yes. Yeah, going but back the bar to was closed by then, uh -huh. by the time they found her. And we're already way behind the eight ball way behind the eight ball, and that's why it's so important to get our first responders to recognize that there is a problem with this person and there's evidence that is dissipating somewhere. Let's talk about the evidence. What kind of evidence are we talking about? Are you talking about potentially even finding that glass with residue absolutely. in it? Absolutely. If we what can other find things? that glass, absolutely. Um, well, the evidence on her person also. What, what would be on her person? Well, for instance, her urine or her blood, we need to get to that, like Trinka said, okay. within four hours or 12 hours. And that wasn't done because they didn't recognize, they thought she placed herself in that situation. So they didn't recognize that she had a problem. And you're talking about the first responders, did not Correct. You? you can hear on the tape where the officer is yes. saying, didn't you share your phone number with him? And, yes, and I things did. like that. Mm -hmm. She, In my opinion, she believed that, that the woman placed herself in that man's car, which ultimately led to being on, in his home and on his couch. How do you do a timeline if the victim perhaps has got amnesia, is not going to be able to say, well, I remember this, or this. is it a matter of taking the pieces Forensically, Take every little piece Absolutely. You, can. You, you look at, you know, they may have, she may have a bar tab. Maybe she bought dinner and paid for drinks, or maybe her friends did. You look at every little tidbit. In that particular case, um, I think there ultimately there was a barmaid that remembered seeing her walk out the door and was able to identify the guy. So, you know, you, you take every little tidbit. This is where. Details are so crucial. Interviewing people, interviewing mm -hmm. the parking lot attendants, Don't discount checking, anyone. checking the video cameras in the parking lot if there are some, every little detail. Are there video cameras that perhaps cover a, a bar in this situation where she There may be one in the parking lot if they have security. There may be one at the bank across the street. I mean, you know, it mm -hmm. just it depends. But um, And then when the person comes back to, you know, when they're first, and I don't mean from unconsciousness, but back to from being under the influence, the first thing they remember is they look up at a clock and it's, it's 2 a.m. Sure. And the last thing they remember, you know, or their friends remember was around 10. You know, well, so that's, you a classic, back time. that's a classic four hours that involve GHB, whereas if it's eight hours, it's more likely, you know, Rohypnol or other benzos. And you, timeline, timeline, timeline. The most important thing, starting with the onset. You know, you're served the second drink or the first drink. Five minutes later, 15 minutes later, you're acting bizarre. That's your first part of the timeline. And then the friends, things that they remember. Yeah, she was acting like an idiot for 30 minutes on the dance floor or whatever. Um, maybe the barmaid happened to remember something about when they left. Um, and then her next recall. Every little tidbit is so crucial because it tells you what drug it might have been. You know, this is where you're going to piece together what kind of drug you, you're thinking. And this is where you start the path. Um, let the drugs talk to you. And they won't talk to you if you don't listen. Mm -hmm. Right. Let the drug talk. And it's really cool when you're able to go, you know what, based on that, see, every drug has its own signature. And you go, wow, I think that was ketamine based on the symptoms and the time, or I think that was G or whatever. And then maybe you catch the guy and bingo, he's got ketamine in his pocket. You were right. That's awesome. Or you catch it in her system. You, you make up that timeline because your expert witness is going to need it, especially if you end up with well, a negative prosecution talk. prosecution is going to need yeah, this. Yeah, you're going to need that to explain. You know, it's not impressive to a jury if I walk in and say, wow, like, you know, she doesn't remember anything, so I think she was drugged. Because their response is, you know, yeah, how convenient that she doesn't remember anything. Yeah. Whereas if I can walk in there and lay out this timeline and give the, that this matches the signature of GHB or ketamine or rohypnol, and this is why, based on the behavior that her friends saw, based on the timing that was involved, that's impressive. 
that's much more impressive than just, yeah, yeah, she doesn't remember anything, so maybe she was drugged. Because you're not going to always get a positive tox. Most right. of the time you're not. And that's what you need, that timeline. I, I want to come back to that. But, Stephen, how important is this timeline in prosecution? Well, it's almost a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> to do a proper job, a prosecutor has to, number one, believe that the suspect did it. And number two, believe that there are sufficient facts and circumstances that a jury will find beyond a reasonable doubt that the person did it. So you have to convince me of both of those before I'm allowed to go forward, ethically or, mm -hmm. or properly. Right. Now, so what does that mean you have to give to a jury? Well, certainly the timeline is extremely important to show where the complainant was and what connection that complainant might have with the suspect and the timeline where the suspect was, which might match. But the point is that the evidence has to include that there also was sexual conduct. So you can't just come in with a timeline which shows some kind of drug. You also have to show physical evidence that there was sexual what conduct. What about your job when it comes to a victim who remembers parts or perhaps absolutely nothing? The evidence might be there, but other than that, the person does not remember. Now, there is not a problem presenting facts to a jury when a victim doesn't remember what happened. Why do you say that? Well, what if the victim were murdered? How would you show that case? Mm -hmm. okay. If the victim died, gotcha. what happened? It's the very same series of proof. You need the first officer. You need the responding detective. You need the witnesses, if any. You need the physical evidence and the scientific evidence. If you have all of that and you have no victim or a victim who does not recall what happened, you can still present the facts to the jury, and they will decide, and they're smart. They know what happened, and they will follow the law if you tell them what the law is, mm -hmm. and they will find the facts and match those facts to the law. Well, let me ask you this. You have a toxicology, toxicology come back. Absolutely nothing is there to support your theory, but you do find something else. You find that the victim perhaps has voluntarily used drugs. Tell me your thoughts on that. Well, again, you're going to have to find out what she was using and why. Was it a medical condition or was she using street drugs? And absolutely that's going to hurt the case if we get it to the prosecution. It's very difficult in, in my county to prosecute these cases. In my three and a half years in my unit, I have not been able to take one yet mostly due to lack of evidence, and that is our problem because we're not recognizing initially what's happening. Well, an important point here is, Dan, it doesn't matter if I'm voluntarily intoxicated. It's still rape. Voluntary intoxication does not negate rape. If I am unable to give or withhold consent, then it's rape. So if I get voluntarily drunk, pass out in the middle of the floor, uh, and a guy comes along and drags me off into the bushes and have sex with me, that's rape, and we forget that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Even if I do voluntarily do drugs, um, you know, if I'm incapacitated and obviously, and the person, especially if the person knows that based on my condition, based on the fact that I'm unconscious on the floor or whatever, it's still rape, and we forget that. But what's important to get across to the victim is you want the truth. You want to know exactly what she did. You want to know whether she t was taking prescription drugs. If she was being treated for something and took medication, legitimate medication, but took alcohol on top of it, now she's incapacitated or drunk, acting weird, you know, still we're talking about consent, unable to give withhold consent. But you want to know exactly what she took. You want to know exactly the timing, whether or not that last dose of medication would have been affected right. by the alcohol. And, again, it's all just a matter of getting first responders, especially to, to immediately take them to the hospital. I don't care if she comes back positive for cold medicine, if she was prescribed it or whatever. You just have to piece it together. But you want her to tell you the truth. I don't care if she, if she smoked crack cocaine an hour ago. I want, want to know it. Mm -hmm. because and you, you want go, the prosecution to have all of it as well. You can go in Absolutely. and deal with that. Okay, she smoked crack and then this guy put GHB in her drink and raped her. Right. You know, but you don't want her to lie about it. And then the defense brings in somebody and says, hey, I smoked crack with her an hour ago because mm -hmm. now she looks like a liar and it's right. hurt her credibility. Stephen, what about pretext phone calls? Describe them for me. How, how do they fit into this? Do you mean that you want the complainant to make a consensually monitored contact with a suspect? Yes, and then to I do. Record it? Mm -hmm. If that's what you mean, then first you have to satisfy the state law. Some states allow 
consensual monitoring under the supervision Some of a states. law enforcement mm -hmm. officer who has jurisdiction. So if it's not your jurisdiction, you're out of your county, then right. don't be doing it. But find somebody who has jurisdiction and get them to supervise the interception. Now, you cannot get better evidence against somebody than their confession. Right? So everybody understands that. And Bonnie's shaking her head, yes. <laughs> if you understand that, yeah. the only thing you have to get around is that the way you got it might cause a jury to feel sympathy for the person they're going to disregard it. So that confession better be specific. And you should have some kind of evidence which shows that this was a bad thing that the person did, not just play loose with it and say, well, here's the complaint and here's the statement. That's not enough. The public wants, if they serve on a jury, to believe they're doing the right thing. So you have to satisfy not only the statute, but you also have to satisfy public perception of what's right. And you want to do this Quickly. right away because you want, you may get a point like admission, you, uh, confession, you may get just partial admissions, or he may tell her, hey, babe, nothing happened. You just got drunk and I put you to sleep mm -hmm. on the couch. And then when you interview him, the detective interviews him, he goes, uh, no, uh, you know, it was consensual. Oh, wait a minute, because on the phone call you're denying that anything it happened. Now you're saying right. it's consensual. Let me bring so up a really case valuable. for you to support just what their problem is from a prosecutor's perspective. Let me Quickly, tell you what please. it is. There's a case called uh, Jesse Smith in the state of New York. There was a lady who said that she met her friend, Jesse, not her boyfriend. She had a boyfriend. They went out drinking, bar to bar. She got very intoxicated on alcohol. He did a lot of drinking. At closing time, she got in the car. They drove to his house. She passed out in the car, so he drove. She was too drunk to drive home, so she stayed at his house in the bedroom. She said she awakened to find semen and pubic hair in her genital area, and I'm sorry being so specific. They interviewed the man. See how important that is. Get a statement. He said, I was voluntarily intoxicated. I passed out on the couch, and I don't remember anything until the morning. The jury convicted him. Now, you try to figure out why did the jury convict him when he's claiming, well, she... I passed out, I don't know anything, so, gee, it could have been consent. Why? What is the answer? See? Well, I don't know the minds of that jury, but from my experience in talking with jurors, I'll tell you what they said. In the back room, when they were arguing back and forth, we need to do the right thing. They said that guy claimed not that they had consensual sex, but that he passed out on the couch and he doesn't know anything. Hmm. And that's baloney because we have proof that somebody had sex with this woman, and now we have the scientific evidence that proves he's the one. Mm. See, so that's how he got found guilty. What does that tell you? That tells you that the detective did a great job interviewing that fellow and getting the statement down perfectly. And that this leads me to my said. question for Bonnie. How do you get the training to be that intelligent, that good, to get that information to the prosecution? Where, where do we need to, what needs to be done? We need to bring people in to our cities, the police academy, or we call it um, inline training, roll call training, people like Trinka Parada um, or someone with her credentials that will train our first line officers and myself what to recognize, what questions to ask, um, interview and interrogation techniques. Mm -hmm. it's, it's out there. We just have to, to bring it to our people. How do we get the word out to possibly uh, suspect victims, uh, men, women, how do we get the word out to them to be careful? What, what can be said? I think they know the word. Everybody knows. But yet Don't it still leave happens. your drink, but it's still happening. People, well, their friends may be drinking too and, and recognize that she's acting out of character, but she's going to the bathroom, she'll be right back. So a perpetrator that is seeing this uh, could perhaps be figuring out whether well, it's two or three women that have come in together. Does he need to, if it's a he, uh, does he need to uh, perhaps uh, uh, get all three of them uh, separated, or, or, or what's what's the technique? What's going on? Well, you know, they may random 
drug three or four different women. And you remember, too, the drink may get to the wrong table by accident, that kind of thing. If, they, if they're drugging the drinks right at the counter, the bartender himself is drugging them, but the wrong barmaid picks up the drink. So, you know, he may drug more than one person. He may target an individual and work very hard to be sure that it's her drink. He may have the bartender working in cahoots with them. There's all kinds of possibilities. Um, but the most important thing is to get across. You've got to do prevention, and you've got to get across to, to women that when you say you're going out and watching each other's back, that means you never leave each other's back. You, they should have gone. They knew something was wrong with her. She was yeah. acting weird. They didn't go to the bathroom with her. So we've got to do some prevention. We've got to do training for first-line officers. They've got to learn to identify these drugs. This is where your narcotics unit needs to work with your sexual, sexual assault unit. You know, if you have a DRE program, the drug recognition experts, they're great for this kind of training because they're learning the specifics of individual drugs. You share that information. You do some public awareness. You do some ed education of your officers, and you really start putting together these cases. They're tough cases. You'll never get them all. We can do a heck of a lot of better job. And that, to me, is the exciting part. Let's get these guys. They're yeah. bad guys. But Bonnie, are police officers in general getting this message? Are they getting the, the education that they need on sexual assault? I don't think so. Is it not available? I think it's available, but I don't think... Uh, for instance, when we brought Trink in, the, inten the intention was, I think, to bring her back more often until we could get everybody on the department trained. I think money is an issue. Money is a limitation mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Yes. Does that also limitate, uh, uh, you know, getting that message out to other law enforcement agencies around the country, you believe? I, I believe so. I think money is an issue with everybody. And Would you like to hear what the prosecutor thinks about that? Very quickly. Very, Very quickly. quickly. That we have to help the police officer do one thing, and that's know a series of acts to do. Number one, when you get a call and a claim of rape, call a detective on your way. Notify the detective who mm -hmm. handles that. Number two, ask six questions. Who did this to you and how do you know it? What did they do to you and how do you know it? Number three, when did it happen? You need to know that in a hurry because if it's within certain time frames, you want the testing done, right? Where did it happen? If they can tell you that, send somebody else to that place and look for witnesses and physical evidence. And number five, why did it happen? They'll tell you. And then you'll know when you do your subject interview what to be prepared to hear. Right? And number six is don't forget that you don't take a position. Wait for the detective. Tell the detective. Let the detective talk to the person about cooperating with the investigation. Don't get involved in that. Well, this is a is great way to wrap this up. We have run out of time. The hour is just flowing by. Uh, but before we conclude, we're going to leave you with some resources that might be helpful for you as you continue to learn about this topic. On behalf of Trinka Parada, Bonnie Weiss, and Stephen O'Keefe, I'm Stan Rhodes. Thanks for watching Without Consent, Drugs and Sexual Assault.